make sure everything is clear. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Good morning, colleagues. You're all very welcome. Just a few more people coming in at the back. Plenty of seats down here at the front. Don't be shy. So I wish you all a very warm welcome to this side event titled Reaching the Most Vulnerable Climate Action in Fragile and Conflict-Affected Contexts. My name is Michelle Yonatani. I work for UNHCR um, as part of the, the Climate Action Team in headquarters in Geneva. It's my pleasure to be moderating the event today. This is an event that's been co-organized with the International Committee of the Red Cross, and our partners also in ICADA, the International Center for Agricultural Research in Dry Areas. So we have um, about an hour and a half today until 11.30 to explore together uh, this theme. And why, why is this theme on the table? What we all see is that communities are already living on a knife's edge in conflict-affected and fragile contexts. And these people are clearly among those who are least ready and able to adapt to the growing impacts of climate change worldwide. Fragile states are classified by the OECD, and as classified by the OECD, have accounted for only 4% of cumulative CO2 emissions, yet they saw 29% of disaster events globally from 2019 to 2021. Furthermore, they host almost two-thirds of 100 million people displaced by conflict and persecution. That's internally displaced persons and refugees. And, clim and climate-related events bring on millions more displacements each year, including impacts on people already living in displacement. If we just look around us, the ongoing drought impacts in Somalia, the situation following Cyclone Mocha in Myanmar, the recent floods and landslides in the Democratic Republic of Congo, just to mention a few examples. Climate change is amplifying the daily insecurities faced by these communities and further clouding their futures. They are unable to enjoy many of their human rights and they are falling further behind. At the same time, as many will attest, the resilience of communities whose lives are being profoundly disrupted, deeply wounded by conflict, and by the uncertainty and fragility of the context they live in, is extraordinary. Indeed, in the absence of peace and effective protection under governing frameworks and institutional responsibilities, their ability to survive and even recover from adversity is inspiring, and it offers knowledge and lessons for us all. So I think we can all agree that the needs in these contexts are already urgent, and so we are calling for greater priority and delivery of resources and action to enable communities to adapt and to address loss and damage at the intersection of climate, conflict and fragility. In fact, there's important progress on that front with the issue more firmly on the table in the UNFCCC discussions. I'm sure many of you are following that. And we're watching carefully as the Egyptian COP27 presidency hands over the baton to the UAE COP28 presidency this year. Indeed, on his way to join us today, he's, he's uh, just come in and he's still on his way, slightly delayed on the train, but uh, from the UAE presidency team, Mr. Dane McQueen, who's the director of policy and partnerships, will also be providing us with some closing remarks and, so, and help us to look forward to COP28. And for the first time there, a dedicated thematic day on peace, relief and recovery along with health, which some of you may be already involved in its preparation for. But before we get to Mr. McQueen, we have a great panel of speakers, three of us with us here in the room, three with us here in the room, and three online from Uganda and Kenya. And after their remarks, I'll be opening the floor for questions from all of you, as well as those online. So if you're following online uh, via the virtual platform, it will be possible for you to participate in the Q&A session by leaving questions and comments in the chat. So uh, just a quick round of uh, introductions, if I may. Um, on the end of the row here, away from me, is Karina Backoffen, who's the Acting Director and Head of Policy at the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Centre. 
online. I don't know if we can see people online already. Well, online, she's out there, is Rose Cobblesinger, who's the, the representative of the children and youth constituency of the UNFCCC, Youngo. And she's also a fellow member of the Warsaw International Mechanisms Task Force on Displacement. As I said, Rose is there online somewhere and based, calling in from Uganda. Um, then here also on the panel with us is Grazia Pasillo, Pacillo, uh, who's a senior economist and evaluator and a co-lead of the CGIAR Focus Climate Security Team. Welcome to you also, Grazia. Um, back online, we have Jennifer Koinante, who's the president of the Yiaku Laiki Piak Trust and a member of the Yaku Indigenous Peoples Group in Laiki Pia County, Kenya. Again, huge apologies for my terrible pronunciation of everybody's names and where you come from. Also online, our only man actually in the group today of speakers is Thomas, Thomas Mango, who's a member of the Bunyala Development Forum and part of the Banyala Indigenous Peoples, a traditional fishing community at the, lake of lake, at the edge sorry, of Lake Victoria in Busia County, also in Kenya. And last but certainly not least, here on my right, uh, Barbara Rosen Jacobson, who's an advocacy advisor working for Mercy Corps and, the Zurich fl and part of the Zurich Flood Resilience Alliance, where she's focusing on climate finance, adaptation, loss and damage, and in particular how these topics are looked at in the nexus, indeed, um, of climate and the humanitarian action or sectors. So without further ado, I'd like to turn to you, Karina, first. And... My question, or a couple of questions here for you to focus on. People enduring conflict are not only among the most vulnerable to the climate crisis, they're also among those most neglected by climate action. So how is the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement building climate resilience in fragile and conflict-affected settings? And what kind of protection risks and needs are you seeing in these operations? Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle, and thank you, everybody, for being here today. It's a real pleasure to be on this panel, and clearly it's a very interesting and popular topic, and, and timely and urgent as well. So people affected by armed conflict, as, as you were describing, uh, Michelle, and violence, and those living in situations of fragility are amongst the most vulnerable to climate change. We know this. And conflict and fragility can not only disrupt lives and livelihoods, it disrupts the economy, it can damage social cohesion, it can weaken institutions and the services they provide, and of course it can force people to move. Conflicts damage the fundamental systems that people depend on to thrive and survive. So I work for the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center and we are a technical center of expertise bridging climate science, policy, and practice. And we support the International Federation of Red Cross Red Crescent Societies and the 192 national societies in the IFRC network as well as the ICRC, which focuses on um, protecting and assisting people in situations of violence and armed conflict. We support the, IF the Red Cross Red Crescent Network to tackle the climate crisis. And we see that addressing how um, resources, action, and support reach people living in fragile and conflict-affected contexts is a rapidly growing area of our work. As I mentioned, this is essential and urgent. Over half of the 25 countries considered most at risk and with least capacity to adapt to the changing climate are mired in conflict. And the evidence shows that the more fragile a country is, the less climate adaptation finance, the less climate finance altogether will reach the country. And so without finance to adapt lives and livelihoods to the changing climate, we will also have... Um, people that are not able to, to, to cope um, as climate events become increasingly frequent, increasingly severe, and are often very predictable. And so we also will see that development gains will be more likely eroded. And of course, losses and damages, a hot topic at uh, the COP this year coming up, will become more and more severe. And so clearly we need more support and action to reach the local level. We also see that the risks are not only climate-related. They're compounding and cascading. In Iraq, for example, tensions are rising around access to water. In Mozambique, where, climate, where communities are actually receiving information on um, the weather that's expected and receiving early warning information, they don't always have places to go to seek shelter that are safe. 
In Mali, pastoralists that would normally travel further distances when rainy seasons fail in search, for example, for grazing lands and water, we're seeing that they're unable to take that approach because of a uh, situation of insecurity. And so clearly the climate uh, crisis is one additional stressor, one additional factor that's wreaking havoc on already stressed systems. And in these fragile and conflict-affected settings, governments, donors, and humanitarian organizations, they focus typically on addressing the root causes and the consequences of fragility and conflict. And this, of course, is valid. We must have attention focus on how to ameliorate and improve these conditions. However, at the same time, we cannot wait for the conditions to improve in order to take climate action. Fragility and conflict often last for decades. And we all know that the climate crisis is urgent and we need action now. So what is the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement doing to build resilience in fragile and conflict-affected contexts? I can give you a few examples today drawn from different parts of the world, and I'm looking forward to hearing also um, from our panelists today about how, how they're experiencing this. In northern Mozambique, for example, in collaboration with local water authorities, the ICRC has improved access to clean water in the community of Montepuez, a city located in the province of Cabo Delgado that has received um, large volumes of people that have been displaced by conflict. Montepuez had a deficient and aging water system that the ISRC is helping to improve, and it's supporting development of a plan to expand that water system so that it can be more reliable in times of heavy rains and also dry periods. And that's being done by taking into account climate and weather related information and risks. But there are, of course, system, there are of course risks in the system that the ICRC would not be able to address on its own. When storms come and lines are downed and uh, storage tank pumps don't work, storage tanks can't be filled, therefore you don't have water saved for the dry periods. And similarly, when the rains are heavy, communities will often have to resort to dirty and unsafe water rather than clean water that's been stored. And so we need investment in longer-term resilience building and longer-term development. And this needs to be an integrated, coordinated approach with the work of the humanitarian sector. In northern Mali, for example, um, the Mali Red Cross has taken action um, in advance of a disaster striking. So Mali Red Cross recently triggered its early action protocol, which means that it's assisted communities to take action in advance of a hazard striking, again, based on climate and weather information. Communities have taken action, and this has been done in conflict settings. And so it is possible to um, act, even though it's often more difficult. Similarly, the ICRC is working with the National Meteorological Agency to ensure that there's better access of, uh, to information on climate and weather in particular to communities that are living in conflict-affected areas. So we are acting. But again, there are limits to what humanitarian actors can do. And all of these programs that I've described are taking place at a very local level. They take place in collaboration with local authorities um, and with the communities as well. Um, the humanita humanitarian organizations such as national societies and the ICRC, they enjoy and have a privileged relationship often of, of trust, close connections with the community. Um, they understand, because of long-standing presence in communities, what is the lived experience and the local knowledge that needs to be informing decisions. Humanitarian organizations can also often test approaches, pilot approaches, and see what works, what hasn't worked. And then these lessons, these experiences, this evidence that's drawn right from the communities can be taken and used to inform policy decisions, investment decisions, and inform how practice can be improved. The unique presence of Red Cross, Red Crescent, of the movement, both at the most local level and in global policy for us, such as, for example, the UNFCCC, means that we span this global to local uh, scale, and we are, of course, present all around the world. And so we are doing as much as we can to um, not only support the systems, but also influence the messaging and influence the action and the support that's being uh, needing to be channeled more to these situations, to these fragile and conflict-affected settings. 
And I would say this is important because in unstable settings where the government may be weak, may not have full access to all of its population, all of its territories, um, it's not always possible to work at large scale. We m must also consider smaller scale approaches that are, again, um, implemented very much driven by locally led uh, action and by local actors. Indeed, there's 175 million people around the world that are living in places that are not under the direct control of central government. So these centralized approaches often don't work. And you need to think about new ways of working, different kinds of partnerships, and different perhaps um, also thresholds for risk that you can take in order to really truly reach those that are most in need. And as I mentioned, uh, on the whole, these are examples of how we are engaging, but it is not enough um, whatsoever to think that these small-scale actions, while in some cases can be expanded, the problem is large. It requires an all-of-systems approach and to deliver clim ambitious climate adaptation action and minimize losses and, damage with the losses and damages, we must really think about working in an integrated fashion, uh, fac, uh, an integrated fashion across the climate, humanitarian development, and peace nexus. And I know Barbara will be talking about this. Thanks, Karina. We're going to have to, to bring your remarks at this point to a close, but perhaps later in the Q&A you can bring in anything further you'd like to say. But for the sake of time, and I know that Rose is also in line from Kampala. Um, Rose, are you there? Uh, yes, Michelle, I'm here. Wonderful. Hello, Rose. Lovely to see your face there on the screen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as I said, Rose is here representing the Children and Youth Constituency. She's also part of the WIM Task Force on Displacement. So, Rose, what challenges and opportunities do you see for young refugees, local community members to lead uh, climate action, including in the hosting, refugee hosting areas of Uganda? And how do you, can you give us some advice also on how we can further amplify the voices of youth representatives from refugee and other vulnerable and underrepresented groups in global policy events like, like here today in, in Bonn, uh, ensuring that you have a seat at the table and a say in decision making? Over to you, Rose. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's really a pleasure being here and uh, speaking on this panel and especially speaking after the. I ICRC speaking because I like ICRC because they are the front of, you know, rescuing people from floods, rescuing people like they're always there and uh, really, really love all the work they're doing. So coming to your question, Michelle, and uh, coming in as a youth representative, I think everyone has heard about vulnerability and how the youth are the backbone of this planet. And when we come to the vulnerabilities of, for example, the African young person, the vulnerabilities are different compared to a young person in Europe, in the US. So there are different root causes to vulnerability, but most of them, when you look at it, it comes from issues of poverty, inequalities and negligence and uh, some, sometimes lots of like racial negligence and racial injustices. Coming to talking about issues with visas and appointments, so many young people could not make it to uh, SB58 and COPS. But also when we talk about the refugees, it's even even worse and special. So I just want to clarify that I am not a refugee, but I work in the refugee space. And uh, in Yungo, in as, as Michelle introduced, I, I started a working group last year on migration, refugees and climate change. And uh, I work with a number of young refugees and uh, the vulnerabilities are actually different. Leave alone those ones I've just talked about, such as poverty. But when we come to conflicted areas or areas that are hosting people uh, that have ran from conflicts and different conflicts, whether they are natural resource conflicts or uh, political or social conflicts, actually when climate change comes in the picture, the interconnectedness between climate change, the climate crisis, and these people that have already fled from conflicts and having limited resources, limited access to land, probably no access to jobs, like mostly no access to jobs, to livelihoods, depending on food portions and rations. And 
like life is really hard, no access to education. So yesterday I had an opportunity to talk to uh, Opira, who is a refugee in Palabek refugee camp in Uganda. And we are talking about these issues and uh, informally just talking about the challenges and the realities that he himself and other young people have to go through. And uh, it came back to when you talk about the challenges, their challenges, the challenges in displacement settings are totally unique, as you've talked about the limited resources, but then the injustices that come with, the, as, as Michelle introduced, the 29% of the disasters go to these refugee camps. If I take you back a little bit, in 2022, there was a very big flood in South Sudan, erasing the refugee camps. How sad is that? People who are already homeless, people who are already trying to survive and and suffering from lack of almost everything, if, like depending on, you know, important organizations that are trying their best with limited resources supports all these people. Uganda, my country herself, always proud of the fact that we have this this progressive refugee policy, but the challenges are still immense. When you look at resilience uh, projects, climate projects, and the climate finance that come, most of them go to, not even most of them, it's very few. There's no resources, there's no money that's coming through, uh, regardless of the promises by the wealthy nations. So the, the little, the very little money that make it to, to, to the local communities, mostly goes to kind of like agriculture, but when, when we come to the refugee settings, the refugee settlements, people don't have land. Those ones who have, like, they have tiny plots of land, and that means that the finance is not going to reach them. So when we talked about, when we chatted with Opera about this, and uh, I asked, what is, it that, what is it that we can actually do to ensure that maybe the climate finance reaches the refugees in the context that works for them? So I remember talking about localization a lot. The discussions from SB, SB58, the discussions from COP, they stop there. Usually there are no refugee representatives. One of the most vulnerable, maybe the most vulnerable uh, group of people, and not just refugees when you talk about the children and youth, the young people, the the youth refugees, the children refu refugees, those are even more vulnerable than the general uh, vulnerability of youth, as we say. So there are limited studies on the issues of vulnerability and, uh, and, and innovations or solutions that work in the refugee space. We have, the, uh, we have research on, I mean, as Eastern Horn of Africa, there's still a research gap in general, but it's even worse when it comes to the refugee uh, or displacement uh, settings. So there's limited research to show the actual uh, solutions that work specifically in the refugee settings. And uh, for that reason, I feel like we, we cannot solve the refugee issues. As we always say in the activism world, nothing for us without us. If refugees cannot uh, cannot tell their own stories, if refugees cannot develop their own solutions, and we keep thinking that, well, these important, don't quote me wrong, the SBs, uh, the SB58, the COPs are very important. But if their impact does not get down to the last night to the most vulnerable person, if the finance does not reach there, if the loss and damage finance does not come to this person like Opera and the rest, then it does not make any any sense. So, and then the other thing we also talked about with Opera was more on uh, on the limitation on registration to attend, uh, let's say, a COP. You find when you're registering for a badge, you're required to put um, your your passport number. But then we found out that there are young people in refugee camps that are leading on climate change, regardless of the limited resources they have, but also the limited education that is there. And those people want to have their voices heard. But when it comes to registration, these people cannot make it because usually it's a passport number that is asked and no provision for, let's say, a refugee ID number. 
And we also talked about the fact that, yeah, there are challenges on, you know, getting a refugee from a country to go to another country. There, there are all diplomatic issues around their situation. But then Freya told me, you know what, my double problem shouldn't stop me from representing my voice and representing the voices of my people. And the double problem he was talking about was the fact that he's a refugee, but at the same time, it's one of the more, like, his community is one of the most vulnerable to climate change. So, so these people should be the one at the front line. And are there provisions for things like this, national spaces? And I remember also talking to me that uh, maybe we can also, because by the time you reach an international space, you need the capacity when you go to this national space to be able to actually be meaningfully engaged and uh, participate and not just passively lead from the front and not from the behind, but also not just being on the table, but being on the menu. The many as youth, youth refugees are there and you're also on the table. So, and that is the thing that I, I wanted to emphasize today. That's fantastic, and, uh, Rose. Sorry, I hate to cut you off. I really do. You're absolutely inspiring what you're saying. Thank you so much. Maybe we can come back to you again, like I said, in the Q&A session. But let's keep moving. And now thanks, we'd like... Michelle. Thanks so much, Rose. Stay there. Don't go away. Um, so now I'd like to um, turn to you, Grazia, and a, qu a couple of questions for you also. So here we're focusing a little bit more on the partnerships. And perhaps you can explain to us or share with us the types of innovative partnerships and initiatives that can help to build that really important evidence base for climate action in fragile and conflict-affected places. And what, what can approaches to research and data collection in these settings do to incorporate local and indigenous knowledge? Thank you. Thanks a lot, Michelle. It's, uh Really hard to, to follow the fantastic intervention by, by Rose, super enthusiastic, so thanks thanks a lot for your remarks. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here and to really talk about an issue that is particularly important to, to myself, to, to the Alliance of Biodiversity at our research institute, and to CGIR. For those who don't know what CGIR is, is a consortium of research, 12 research institutes working on tropical agriculture. Uh, we work with uh, more than 3,000 partners in uh, more than 90 countries. So partnership is particularly important to us. And we do so to advance the transformation in the, in the food, land, and water systems in a climate crisis. And as part of uh, our reform in CGIR, we've adjusted and strengthened our strategy to better reflect our partners' perspectives and needs, leading to science and innovation to exactly underline and address the underlying causes of uh, the root causes of, uh, of different problems of vulnerability like Karina was, was highlighting uh, uh, the importance of to look at these causes. Our research focuses on producing state-of-the-art evidence on and science on land, water, and food systems that could help policymakers in making better decisions in terms of targeting, programming decisions over investments for climate, uh, climate, agriculture, food, and security. Specifically, uh, my, uh, my team, the CGR-focused climate security team, looks at the intersection of the climate conflict, fragility, peace, and security with a transformative adaptation lenses. Like um, the messages from Rose and also some, some, some um, thoughts from, from Karina really made me think that, uh, you know, highlight the fact that the work that we've been doing so far on, on climate adaptation and finance uh, is not enough. Uh, we really need to, to, to uh, aim to address not only the direct causes, but also the root causes of conflict, to, to really transform the way we are doing climate adaptation, climate mitigation and finance, to make this a real instrument uh, of peace. And specifically, we look on how the climate intersects and exacerbates root causes of conflict and how conflict can, can really um, affect the ability to do a good job in our climate adaptation, in our climate, climate transformation. So how can we really achieve climate resilience, but, but at the same time uh, contribute to peace? And understanding the root causes of conflict, um, addressing uh, the, 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 the compound risk issue and helping policymakers in make the, making better better decision and transform the way that we identify and design solutions really cannot be done by ourselves. We really need the integrated approach. And the, the whole climate security agenda really is focused on breaking the cycle, the, the silos between the 
humanitarian development and peace nexus and uh, creating innovative partnerships that really can leverage multi stakeholders, um, multiple stakeholders, and produce a coherent and effective uh, policy making uh, and decisions that can help sustaining and creating what we call the climate resilient peace, um, a, a transformative process where climate resilience and peace building objectives are effectively aligned. And the first acknowledgement of creating this climate resilience piece is the fact that we need to transform the way that we work. And this transformation can only happen if we strengthen local actors and local champions of change, like Rose was, was mentioning, by partnering, partnering with those actors that are, that are able to reach the impact and scale. And let's take the example of, of some of our initiatives that are really embracing this uh, uh, highly demand-driven and highly participatory approach, the, the Climate Resilience Initiative and the Fragility and Conflict and Migration Initiative that we just recently launched. Uh, for instance, the first initiative, the Climate Resilience, was designed uh, following the consultation of 200 plus partners from the six countries that we have targeted. And as we moved ahead with the implementation phase, we co-designed, we co-developed and tailored our research in each, each country directly with, with the local partners and local governments, as well as organizations that not only understand the needs, vulnerability and risks of the affected population, but also are better positioned to identify solutions. And for instance, in Kenya, we are partnering, partnering with the Climate Smart Agriculture Multi-Stakeholder Platform, which is a network and organization Organizations that are interested in pursuing and improving climate smart agricultural practices that is led by the Ministry of Agriculture. And, and, and our work, our joint work, focuses on raising awareness on the importance of the topic and working together to mitigate the impact of climate on fertility, but also to co-design solutions. And we do so with other organizations, such as Simlen in Kenya, with the Frontier Counties Development Council, to develop climate investment, uh, climate security investment plans to address the issue that we have been raised uh, in many instances that climate finance needs to be aligned to peace building objectives. But also we, we, we shouldn't forget that CGIR, we are a research organization, research for development organization, and as such we are not able to reach um, the scale and magnitude that other organizations such as humanitarian and development organization um, can, can reach. So part of this strategy to really leverage the, the, the comparative advantage of different part and actors in humanitarian and development peace nexus is to second some of our staff into organizations such as WFP and IOM. I see uh, my, uh, our colleague from IOM in the, um, in the audience, to, which allow us to effectively tailor our research to the needs of the organization to inform the operations of those organizations that can reach the impact at scale, but also to leverage our respective comparative advantage. We are scientists working on food, land, and water systems. A humanitarian and development organization can reach impact and scale. How can we make our research an instrument for the work of those that can reach the last mile, can give voice, and can address the needs of the most vulnerable? And our model is certainly not perfect. Effort, but we believe that none of our work is possible without this integrated approach that uh, Karina was mentioning. And none of our work is possible if we don't engage directly with the communities that are affected, and the local experts that are more knowledgeable than, than us in terms of what is needed in, in the countries. And it, it was 30 years ago, back in the 90s, that the, the South African disability rights movements coined the expression, uh, nothing about us without us aiming to reduce really the, the northern dominance, dominance in the global research and decisions regarding what is needed for the global south. So the yeah, thank you. So really, um, what we see, the, the evidence is that African researchers and African local experts, they're not all, the, the, the community affected across the world, they're not giving enough attention, they're not giving enough funding, they're not giving enough resources, or no, and not enough voices. So the, the, these developments and this localization agenda is really at the heart of what we do. We recently launched the, our Climate Security Observatory, which is a decision support tool that will help policymakers uh, um, uh, address 
answering four main questions. The how, how is climate exacerbating existing insecurities that can lead to fragility and conflict? Where is this happening? For whom? And what can we do to mitigate this impact? And the approach that we use here on top of all of the science, uh, uh, desk review, data analysis, etc., is really to integrate the voice of co the communities that are mostly affected and integrating the voices of local experts to make sure that what we're doing is really addressing uh, the, these needs. And it's a co-design, a co-development co co approach that is really the heart of whatever we do. Um, so I'm very happy that today we, in our panel, uh, some of our partners, um, local partners from the local communities are present that can, can really uh, ha can really have the, the space that is needed to understand what needs to be done. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you so much, Grazia. So let's focus back down on the local level again. And I believe um, Jennifer Coinante, are you there online, Jennifer? Jennifer, can you hear us? Jennifer is the president of the Yaku Laikipiak Trust and a member of the Yaku Indigenous Peoples Group in Laikipia County in Kenya. Yes? Aha. Jennifer, we yes. see you now. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer. I was just uh, repeating Thank your introduction. You. It's so great to have you with us. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. So, yeah, I was yes, I was on a phone. That's why there was some delay when, for me to start speaking. Well, you're loud and clear now, so that's wonderful. Jennifer, okay. the, the Mukogoda Forest in Laikipia County in Kenya, where you're based, has experienced intercommunity conflict, we understand, due to the effects of drought and encroachment from surrounding pastoralist groups. Can you describe the dynamics you're witnessing on the ground, the challenges your, your community is, faces, and how you're leading conflict-sensitive climate adaptation and community-level efforts for peaceful coexistence and for the management of local resources. That was a rather long sentence, but I hope you caught what I said. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Um, yes, I'm Jennifer Koinante. I work for Yaku Lakipia Trust. I belong to a community, a minority tribe called Yaku, and they have their language called Yakunte language. Uh, the community of Yaku uh, among uh, minorities in Kenya and also in East Africa. We have some network that we work together because we are few and we also have uh, a lot of uh, challenges. So we have some network that we sometimes have a chance to talk together and uh, maybe make big meetings to uh, uh, amplify our voices. So uh, the Yaku are, are people um, among the minority of Kenya. Just to mention a few other minorities are the Molo, Sengwe, Rolgiek, Ndoroi, Sowata, and, and more, more, more others, even in Tanzania. Uh, Yaku are originally Kushaite community. So many years ago, they came from Ethiopia and they inhabited the Mgogodo forest. Yaku have Two uh, four clans, the uh, the Sialo, the Orundi, Losos, and the Nadungoro. So uh, the four clans uh, makes the tribe called Yaku, and we have said they are among the minorities in in Kenya. Uh, we have, as uh, you've spoken, we have a lot of challenges. We, um, as being the minority, we we don't have representation in the government, and we face a lot of uh, assimilation. Uh, we are assimilated by our neighbors, the Maasai, and we have a lot of conflict, especially on land issues. And uh, currently, we have now the effect of climate change, 
we are having a lot of challenges and uh, a lot of conflict between uh, the, the Yaku, the Maasai, the Samburu, and uh, the Borana at the Isiolo side, which is the boundary. So the issue that we have is uh, a lot of people would like to live in Mukogodo, where is the home of Yaku, because it, it is the best um, geographical place. It, it has a better vegetation, and uh, we have a forest there that Yaku have defended for many years, and uh, we are, they are not ready to, to live or to be evicted by the government or by anybody. So at times we have a lot of people during, especially the drought, the prolonged drought that we just had. All the communities come to that forest with a lot of cows, and the, the Yaku really feel affected because some of them fell trees to feed the animals with the plants, and sometimes they just cut the tree from uh, the stem, meaning that that is the end of that tree. And this is a very painful situation where the people who loved the trees and they lived and they fed on honey and the fruits from those trees when they are being destroyed. So those are the conflicts. And um, uh, Iyaku were, were hunter-gatherers. And they, they, are, they, 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 they hunted very with the traditional knowledge. With their traditional knowledge, they, they hunted wildlife and they also uh, collected fruits and the roots from the vegetation and that is how they and the honey from from the flowers that is why they love the vegetation because honey they, it was everything to them uh now things have changed so uh, the yaku must uh, think and they think out of the box so that they can be able to continue uh, protecting their land and they continue uh, coming up with some other strategies of alternative livelihood because the increasing number of the Yaku themselves and the neighbors, it is, uh, it is affecting the forest so much. So, however, we are trying to save the degradation of the land. Uh, we, we must also think what next? So Yaku is working with the networks, as I said, and they, they work with the, they, they, they look for partners to be able to support them, to do the documentation, because what we, we want to do as the organization, we've been working on documenting our, our traditional knowledge, which is so rich, and we, we have come with different books, uh, an example I'll show you, this is a very nice book that we have documented. This is a biocultural protocol. So the, by, by we are documenting all our plants in our language, all our natural resources, and uh, so that we can, all the language, we have a booklet, we have an app that we have created, I'll share with the, maybe Irene. Uh, an app that uh, we have uh, uh, meant a human. We are we are we are so restoring all our documentation to make our culture the very rich culture that uh, uh, preserved the Mukogodo forest to continue so that we can transfer that to our children and for the the, the posterity. So we want to the, the, we also have a solution to those problems. Uh, that's what I'm saying. We network with the partners, restoration of our traditional knowledge, empowering the community with the local knowledge to be able to document protocols so that they can help them access and share equitable, equitably their own resources. So we are also writing now a, a book called MAT, Mutual Agreed Terms, because we have a lot of resources. In, we have a lot of herbal, herbal medicine. We have products that are food-based. We have gum and we have aloe vera. So we are documenting all this and we are coming up with a, 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 a law that shows when you come there and remove the aloe vera, you have to pay something. That one becomes a livelihood for the people. And we, are, we, we want to especially go to what can we use without destroying the tree? 
like uh, we save the tree, but we sell the honey. Because it is good to have the honey that you can harvest, but the tree is still li- alive. So extract like gum. We remove the gum, but the tree is still alive. Uh, we do the bead work. We, are, we have a, a ushang. Actually, that is something that we are, we are planning a big meeting for women to do an association and they approach the government and other partners to support them, do the bid work, and they look for the market all over the world and improve that value addition. So like, alternative li- livelihood is a very important to strategy for the, our organization and if also for our partner. Jennifer, I think, uh, Jennifer I'm is, so sorry to, to interrupt you as well there. You've already shared with us so many rich points. I think yeah. many of the things you're talking about in terms of preserving your, your local knowledge, your, your cultural heritage, are absolutely critical to be heard here, especially in relation also to to the loss and damage discussions and the non-economic losses. I think you're giving us such a wonderful concrete example of what that really means and what indeed you yourselves at the local level are already doing about it. So thank you, Jennifer. Maybe we can please stay with us because perhaps there will be questions from colleagues uh, and people in the room here later on. But let's move now to Thomas Mango. Thomas, are you there online? Yes. Hello, Thomas. You're very welcome. Again, Thomas from the Bunyala Development Forum and the Banyala Indigenous Peoples, this traditional fishing community, community, where I understand, Thomas, you're involved in local level institutions to manage the Lake Victoria fishery and um, efforts to reduce the the fishers' uh, dependence on cross-border resources that's increased in recent years due to the effects of flooding and drought and over-farming activities in Busia, which is also reducing fish stocks. Could you describe some of the challenges that your community is facing, the consequences, and how you think they can be resolved? Over to you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to mention, I want to start by appreciating and thanking particularly the meeting for giving me an opportunity to share our challenges, the consequences and how it is interlinked with the conflicts in the region and also the actions, uh, the proposed actions that should be taken. I have five points. Uh, one is uh, one of the challenge is seasonal uh, variability. Number two is flooding. Number three is uh, food insecurity. Uh, number four is overfishing. And number five is low capacity building among the communities and stakeholders on resource utilization. Um, I want to start by mentioning particularly on seasonal variability. We, uh, the consequences that we face today is increased drought frequencies We also have a lot of uh, irreversible decrease in livestock numbers. We have a lot of rising uh, sea level or lake backflow, which has caused a lot of devastating effects to the community. We have reduction in crop production due to climate change, which has led to poor yields and poor livelihoods. We also have flood and declining uh, biodiversity. Uh, Some of these issues has led, particularly how it is interlinked to the conflict in the region, is now we have a lot of increased uh, domestic conflicts because of uh, lack of adequate food. We have a lot of increase in uh, human wildlife conflicts and even livestock vis-a-vis the human uh, crops. Then we have a lot of increased dependency on food from neighboring countries and counties and overtaxing of traders across the border. Some of the proposed action on this is particularly uh, the issues around defining the period in the year when fishing is not allowed. Then restoration of the, uh, of the wetland is critical because most of the breeding zones for the fish is within the, uh, the wetlands. The other aspect is enhancing the capacity of indigenous people and the local communities so that they can be able to cope with the climate change. Adoption and uh, uh, adoption of salt seasoned crops and drought resistant crops is very critical. Also, ensuring better forest management and uh, sustainable agriculture and embracing conservation based uh, solution is critical. Uh, number two, on floods, some of the challenges that we have experienced is particularly 
the sudden intense rains leading to the displacement of people, destruction of, play, uh, of, of crops. Uh, we have also uh, experienced some loss of lives. Uh, we have also had a lot of damage to infrastructure and landing sites and post-harvest losses, rotting of fish, and blocking of transportation routes because of the hyacinth and other uh, things. Uh, this is interlinked to, as we have more frequent and intense flooding, is also associated with loss of lives and widespread loss of property and infrastructure damage. Increasing scarce natural resources have led to higher frequency of intra-community conflicts. And some of the proposed uh, actions would include particularly implementation of swamp and lake restoration programs, uh, procure water master or dredger machine to maintain the opening of canals, channels and river desilting or and river training, restore the swamp's ecological state to ensure that constant provision of uh, ecosystem services, mainly flood protection, irrigation water and non-timber products. The other aspect is particularly is on non-structural measures where there is need to develop policies such as disaster and climate change policies and legislations to help control uh, the emerging trends. The other aspect is particularly implement resource management, resource management uh, particularly on uh, uh, rehabilitation of degraded fishing sites. I would move a bit faster because of time. Um, on uh, overfishing, uh, we have a lot of challenges on uh, overfishing. We have now dwindling stock of fish. We have now loss of uh, agricultural livelihoods. We have a lot of conflicts in the lake between the Ugandans and uh, the Kenyans, fisher folk, and the securities because some of the draconian punishments that the uh, Ugandan uh, security forces uh, enforce to the Kenyan fishermen is very draconian because sometimes they feed them with fresh fish uh, and uh, even caning uh, people just on the stomach instead of arresting them and taking them to prisons. Uh, the other aspect is that uh, because of this, uh, because of those regulations that have been put in place by different governments, the two governments, the fisher folk did not have adequate capacity and particularly understanding. So some of the things that we can be able to mention as an, uh, an uh, as action because of time is that uh, we really need to seek livelihood in uh, farming and livestock, uh, diversify and protect livelihood strategies. The other aspect is also helping the fisher folk to adopt to fish ponds and fish cages within Lake Victoria and on the ground so that they can be able to improve their livelihood. Uh, the other aspect is particularly on food insecurity. I will just mention particularly uh, because of the rain, uh, rain patterns, we have had a lot of challenges. I just want to move to actions that are supposed to be undertaken under uh, under uh, food security and loss of agricultural livelihoods is that uh, as much as we have had particularly uh, mainly young populations doing the fishing and even some are migrating to the lakes and we have a lot of population now in the lake and they are using uh, some of the gears that are not acceptable by law and this has really contributed and we are saying there is need for climate change in uh, forcing Bunyala population into a livelihood activity that is directly associated with cross-border insecurity because they are now leaving the land and moving to the lake. So some of the interventions we are saying we need to foster climate smart and conservation agriculture, increase the community capacity in adopting to increasing climate variability, and also the other aspect is foster livelihood diversification through conservation and climate smart agriculture. That's we should be I'm so sorry, um, Thomas, to cut you again. We're running short of time. I think 
you've made a really rich um, um, intervention there, so many really concrete points that really point to the reality on the ground for your community. Thank you so much. Please stay with us. We're going to move to our last speaker on the panel here, Barbara Rosen Jacobson. And Barbara, so again, you're coming from Mercy Corps and as part of the um, Zurich Flood Alliance, uh, Resilience Alliance, excuse me. Um, so let's focus on finance now, about the, re the, the resources and, and how they're basically not sufficiently reaching fragile conflict-affected uh, areas of the world. Um, what's stopping that finance reaching people on the ground, these vulnerable communities, and how can we reduce current blockages to encourage more finance for fragile and conflict-affected contexts? Over to you, Barbara. Thank you so much, and thanks to all the other panelists as well, uh, and especially those coming from, from Kenya and Uganda. It's been really interesting listening to your stories, and I think they really resonate also with this climate finance piece. Um, as we've established by now, many fragile and conflict-affected areas are highly vulnerable to climate change, um, and they are often at the forefront of climate-induced disasters. Uh, and logically, this should mean that they should receive funding that is proportionate to their needs. Um, but we found, as Karina also mentioned, that the more fragile a country is, the less climate finance it has historically received. Um, next slide, please. So the map you see here on the slide is drawn from a study we conducted in 2020 that looks at the per capita climate finance received uh, by different countries. And while non-fragile states, um, as defined by the World Bank, receive on average more than $150 uh, per capita per year in adaptation finance, uh, this is only 2.1 US dollars per person per year in extremely fragile states. Um, the countries that are red on this map uh, receive less than 5 US dollars per person per year. Uh, in climate adaptation finance, and this includes very uh, vulnerable countries like Democratic Republic of Congo, Yemen, Mali, and uh, also some of the countries that we've heard from today. Um, next slide, please. So clearly, there is a disconnect, uh, and those countries that need climate finance more seem not to receive it. Um, and... It should be noted that climate finance is insufficient for, for all countries, right? for all developing countries, whether they are very fragile or not. But um, the needs, uh, the, the, the climate finance that fragile countries receive dwarfs compared to the needs of fragile states. And one example is Somalia. Um, for example, it needs about 5.5 million, a billion US dollars per year in adaptation and mitigation finance, uh, but in uh, the year 2019-2020, it only received 321 million US dollars, uh, which is less than 20 US dollars per capita. Next slide. So, uh, in response to your question, uh, why is this happening? Um, it is, as already mentioned by, by many of the panelists, it is difficult to intervene in, um, in these contexts, uh, but it doesn't mean that it shouldn't happen. And we've identified through, through a research we've done um, uh, last year, we identified four main challenges related to channeling climate finance to fragile and conflict-affected areas. Uh, the first one is related to strategic will and the complexities that exist in these areas uh, that are often at odds with the risk appetite of climate finance providers. The second is related to planning and development of programs. Often climate finance is related to very rigid accreditation standards, um, incompatible with the kind of volat volatile situations in many uh, fragile conflict-affected contexts. Um, and this is also a challenge for implementation and delivery, as climate action is often not designed to be adaptable to this kind of context, uh, and doesn't take into account conflict sensitivity, which is very important in any program that uh, works in such a context. Uh, and finally, ME processes are often quite centralized in climate funds and, and unable to monitor the, the and adapt to the uh, different challenges on the ground. Uh, next slide. Um, so luckily, 
there are also a lot of solutions uh, and plenty of ways to solve these challenges. And uh, on this slide, there are a couple of kind of categories of uh, best practices. Um, but we've also heard from our other speakers about all of the different ways in which um, programs can work in these contexts. So first, uh, there are ways to mitigate risk strategies uh, that can be deployed in, and flexible um, funding tools such as crisis modifiers, adaptive, adaptive programming principles, so basically adapting uh, the funding and the programming depending on the different developments uh, in country. Second, uh, partnering with local actors is key, and we've heard a lot of that today in the discussion. Um, they are the ones with access to the communities. They are the ones who understand how to adapt to the local context. They are the ones that understand what is even needed. And as we've heard, especially from, from Jennifer and Thomas, traditional knowledge is very important here. And finally, or finally, fourth, I think, um, as public finance is often not enough, there are innovative sources that can be used also in fragile and conflict-affected situations, such as small grant facilities or public-private so funding solutions, such as peace bonds, and they're a very interesting case study. Um, and... Um, just as a last point, we need to remember to place the needs of countries and communities at the center of all of these processes. Uh, this also means moving beyond silos, humanitarian development, peace, climate silos. And in the end, there are many ways in which we can design, fund, and implement these programs that reach the most volatile settings. And this should um, this should mean this should not be difficulty, uh, and risks should not be an excuse. Uh, for a lack of funding, because we've seen throughout this panel that funding, that implementing programs in these contexts is possible. Over thank, to you. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, lots to, to dig into and to further think about there. Uh, this climate financing piece is so, so very important. And I'd just like to take this quick opportunity to, to tell you all that UNHCR also today is annou announcing the launch of a climate action and finance mega pledge. This is moving towards the Global Refugee Forum at the end of the year, which is supporting the implementation of the Global Compact for Refugees. And we did certainly invite all partners, yourselves, all of that huge knowledge to, to, to mobilize and join us in, 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 in making those efforts. So last but not least, Dane McQueen, thank you so much for joining us. I believe you've just come in. Um, and one of the things we wanted from this event was to make sure we were supporting and linking to, indeed, the thematic day that the presidency for COP28 has, has now put on the table. Uh, we're all terribly interested and very excited about that. Dane, if you'd like to say a few words. Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much for the invitation to join you today. I was very excited to receive this concept note and to see uh, just how much more uh, solidity and consensus there is on this topic than there was even you know, th two or three years ago. Um, as you can imagine, where we sit in the world is the UAE. This is a, a kind of non-question for us. Uh, Horn of Africa, Sahel, uh, Iraq, Syria, uh, Afghanistan, I mean, just overwhelming evidence of climate impacts on, on instability, um, on uh, the need for humanitarian relief, et cetera. So whether you're calling it you know, extreme adaptation or loss and damage or climate security, it's all a, a need for a, a meaningful response to this uh, increasingly severe set of impacts that we're seeing uh, and that have big impacts uh, you know, even beyond the borders of the communities or the countries where uh, the impacts are, are localized. So from our point of view, especially in this year of the global stock take, uh, we want to surface issues like this and, um, and put them forward and, and ask, you know, what are the set of solutions that, that we can pursue? And you know, a lot of these are, are a bit awkward and thorny, um, particularly when we're talking about finance, um, because it, for a lot of people, it's a zero-sum game. And so donors say, I don't want to give more money. I don't have any more to give. Uh, Middle-income countries say, are you going to take money away from me? Um, so these are things that we need to, to put on the table. Um, and over the last, I guess, eight months now, uh, we've been doing a series of consultations with uh, a mix of, of humanitarian, peace-building, development, uh, climate actors, uh, a lot of them uh, you know, really reinforcing what we've, we've heard today, particularly uh, from our, our colleagues in East Africa. Uh, and we've come up with a, a kind of 
say, menu of deliverables um, that we'll be socializing uh, and, and really campaigning on, I guess, you could say, for the, the next uh, six months into COP28. Uh, so maybe I'll just uh, provide a little bit of, of overview of what that is, uh, kind of three buckets that we're looking at. The biggest one, the one that everyone keeps coming back to, is the finance. Um, and really, uh, you know, going to, to the Mercy Corps point, it's, it's how do you close that gap? Um, you know, a number of proposals, particularly from developing or highly impacted countries, are simply uh, increase the portfolio allocations to FCV settings. Um, this is probably the maybe the hardest one. Um, where I think there is uh, maybe more political appetite is around some of these reforms on access. Uh, so going to this question of risk appetite uh, and the, the accreditation standards uh, that are applied and that are quite prohibitive for a lot of these uh, uh, governments and communities. Uh, localization targets uh, are another one that people are raising uh, consistently. Um, and, and that relates to this uh, other dimension of absorption capacity. So uh, how can you help communities actually take the resources uh, and, and, and use them uh, in a conflict-sensitive way? Um, the other one that comes up uh, is early warnings for all uh, and anticipatory action. Um, so 30 countries have been announced as the kind of uh, first round of, of implementation for these systems. Uh, so we would really like to see an investment package by the time of COP28. And then the third one is... Uh, on this advocacy point and just people making a lot of noise that there is a gap, that there are uh, actually mechanisms in place that can be scaled up, that do get money uh, into settings like this, um, that are localized, um, and and to just keep uh, thinking through the options and thinking through the solutions. So we, we are uh, hosting, the, I guess, the first ever uh, relief, recovery, and peace days. You can tell that was very negotiated. <laughs> on the terminology, uh, but the idea is really to put a human face on, on the impacts that we're seeing. We're holding this back to back with the summit so that it's a you know, kind of message for world leaders uh, about where uh, political attention needs to be applied. Uh, and we're hoping that this can be a venue where some of these uh, uh, deliverables uh, uh, can be landed depending on how we go over the next six months. So we, my, my ask to everyone in the room would, would really just be to keep raising this issue as something that has to be addressed uh, and to, to think about kind of what the levers are, particularly with, uh, with shareholders of, of climate finance institutions. So th uh, thank you so much and, and looking forward to, to at least initiating and, and getting some of this over the line by COP28. Thank you so much, Dane. Now we have a few minutes, everybody, before the close um, for, you, for your questions from the floor. So if you'd like to raise your hands um, when I call you, uh, could you just please introduce yourself very briefly? Lady at the back over there. And just to recall, everybody, we also have Rose, Jennifer, and Thomas online. Though you can't see them just now, they're still there in case you have questions for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Michelle Bensing. I work on the gender, climate, and peace and security nexus. And gender wasn't really a topic so far at this panel. So I would like to ask a question in this regard because we know, right, like climate induced extreme weather events, right, um, exacerbate conflict, which often leads also to an exacerbation of gender based violence. But at the same time, women and girls are peace builders, they are mediators. They bring the solutions to these conflicts, but their solutions are often underfunded. And I was just wondering, you know, how can we bring that focus on the gender climate security nexus within the discussion? And maybe towards you, Barbara, directly, how can we also advance the funding to these solutions? We know that the Peace Building Fund, for instance, is having certain initiatives, like the Gender Promotion Initiative, but multilateral, multilateral climate funds are not looking at that topic and particularly also not at gender. Um, so, yeah, maybe that topic. Yeah. A great question. Thank you very much. I'll take another couple. Uh, Coco Warren at the back there and the lady here and then this gentleman. I'll come back to you in a moment. Thank you, Michelle, and thanks a lot to the panelists. Congratulations to UNHCR and all of the um, organizations that have put together this important side event here at SB 58. I'm curious, uh, oh, excuse me, my name is Coco Warner. I'm director of IOM's Global Data Institute. So my question to the panel or any parties in the room, what data and analysis would be helpful for you to inform 
adaptation action or those actions that build resilience and help reduce risk, particularly in this important area of human mobility. Thank you so much. Thank you, Coco. The lady here. Uh. Um, hi, my name is Nasreen and I'm from Sudan. Um, <clears throat> I think the topic of this session is very much identical to the situation that we are living in Sudan now these days, unfortunately. Um, but my question is, um, how come the people who are really vulnerable um, never get to be here in these meetings and in these areas? I mean, in this hall, with respect to everyone, how many of you is from Sudan, for example? How many is from Libya? How many is from Yemen? How many... Um, I mean, these these countries that are really in a bad situation, to the point that we can't even get their voices to these um, events and these sessions, is really unfortunate. Um, the second thing is, um, we always take talk about system change in terms of climate change and climate finance, for example, and phasing out fossil fuel. But unfortunately, even this um, uh, system change does not count the countries that doesn't have system in the first place. Um, for example, we are talking now about loss and damage and how countries can access uh, finance to, to loss and damage. Uh, but then when there is a loss and damage fund, they will say you need to have a government to apply for it, and the government have to have a certain capacity to actually absorb the money and then the, the pipeline of the projects normally lies between three to four years. I mean, it's not really something possible to be doing. Um, I think my last comment will be <clears throat> when are we going to shift the narrative from, um, from the peace building processes into conflict prevention in the first place? I mean, in school, we always learn that prevention is better than cure, but we never we never actually apply it in real life. We wait until the catastrophe happens, and then everyone run for humanitarian aid. This is not countries want. Not, this is not the young people want, and this is not the SDGs about. It's about leaving no one behind, and already a lot of people are left behind now. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Ahmad? Uh, thank you very much. My name is Imad Adli. <clears throat> I come from Egypt and I represent the Arab Network for Environment and Development, RAID, which is an NGO network in the, in the uh, North African Middle East. My question goes directly to Rose as a young uh, representative here in, uh, in this panel. Um, I've been, uh, Rose, I've been, uh, I started my career when I was still teen a teenager and at that time, I was not able to go anywhere, even I was not having the, the, the privilege of having the technology to communicate even if I'm sitting wherever. My point is, I know that the, the, the youth, they constitute more than 50% of the population, especially from the region where I come from and where all the conflicts my young sister just talked about. But I need to know from you and very quickly, how far you were able to mobilize young people in your, especially when it comes to the vulnerable communities, how you were able to establish the young power within this, because without having this at the very local level, at the, the, the vulnerable communities, we will not be able to make uh, real solutions. So I would like to hear from you how far you were able to, with your colleagues, how far you were able to have the, the young people as a, an agent of change, especially when it comes with all uh, the challenges that you are facing, and we all hear about it, and we know, we know that the finance is not coming easily to to support all your challenges. But local solutions, local uh, 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 resilience has to to be established. And I I, I would like to hear from you uh, the role of the young people mobilized to do that. Thank, Thank you, you Emad. We're rather up against the clock here, folks, so I'm going to have to take that round and offer any of our panelists the opportunity before we close to respond to any of them. There's quite a range of issues, gender, data and analysis, um, access to funding, conflict, conflict prevention, the inclusion of vulnerable voices, and the, and the last point there as well. So let's um, start with those online. Rose, would you like to, to just respond very briefly, please, to any of those issues just raised, whatever for you struck a chord that you'd like to say something about? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you, all the speakers, and the questions, really brilliant questions that have come through. Um, sorry, there's a screen on my side because I'm in a cafe. 
Oh dear. <laughs> question on gender, and you, you can hear me, Rose. You're cutting a little bit. Keep going on gender. How, how, what about now? Okay, go ahead, loud and clear. Okay, Rose, actually you're cutting. I'm really sorry. We have so little time just now. We can't hear you. Um, maybe you can even type in the chat. Can you? Rose, I'm going to have to keep... Now? Rose, type into the chat. We'll see at the end if we still have time, but we're really running tight. I'm okay. so sorry. Type in the chat, please. Okay. 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 Jennifer, Thomas, okay. are you there? Uh, Michelle, yes. I sent something in the chat. If you could read that, and then I'll share about gender too. Uh, Jennifer or Thomas? Hello? Yes, Jennifer, would you like to respond very, very briefly, please, to any of the points that were uh, the questions that just came from our participants here? I think the question that has been asked is so much uh, geared to the youth, Ross. Uh, and, and I think I didn't hear the, the other question because I just went out for a short time for another meeting. Okay, so, okay, know. Jennifer, we'll try and make sure we hear Rose's point on gender. Thomas? Yes, I want uh, to... Make it. Hello? Thomas, Hello? go Hello? ahead. Yeah, uh, what I'm saying is that, uh, for example, uh, I was cut uh, particularly on time, but I want to mention something about, uh, uh, as we have been experiencing the issues around flooding and disasters, we have had a lot of challenges when it comes to gender, and the extreme level of female poverty increases women's uh, vulnerability to disasters. Because during that time, when we have uh, flooding and uh, people have to go to the camps, women become now the burden holder, the workload increases, and even at the family level, they shoulder as caregivers. The other aspect is that uh, women, children, and the elderly, and people living with disability are marginalized during disasters because the relief distribution rely on the existing power structures that reflect particularly parochial structures of the society. The other aspect is that uh, on gender, women and children constitute majority of displaced population, and yet they are excluded from participation in leadership and decision making. And uh, as you look at that, as much as we have the youths, we have the women, we have children and people living with disability, the elderly and women particularly suffer the most consequences. And uh, as we suggest, particularly interventions, most of the interventions should also be geared towards improving the capacity and empowering women to take up the responsibility because the resources that are gotten by women at the end help the entire family than the process that go directly to men. Thank you so much, Thomas. Now I'm going to ask the, the colleagues on the panel here in the room. Let's go the other way around. Let's start here with you, Barbara. I literally am going to give you two, three sentences Hello? maximum. What is it you want to say in response to these questions? You choose that how you use this time. Go. <laughs> Sheila. Uh, Sheila. I'll reply on the gender um, question as well, which was one sentence already. Um, <laughs> I think it's extremely important to hold climate funders accountable to how gender responsive their funding is. And there are gender markers that can be used for this. And I think um, this can be applied to funding that is already channel channeled, but also in the creation of new funds, such as the, the loss and damage fund. It would be great if this can be built into the fund from the outset. Great. Thank you so much, Barbara. Very clear. Grazie. I will touch on Hello, some Sheila. of these um, issues. So the gender, uh, super important again. Uh, we are producing a set of case studies, not only in understanding the, the connection between gender and the climate security nexus, but also in identifying solutions that could be then 
funded and well proposed and fundable. Um, the, the second is in response to, to, to Coco. Thank you very much for this question and on, on the data. Uh, Keep it short, sorry, Grazia. They're going to cut important. us off in a moment. Yes. So, as I Give said, time to the others. Exactly. On the how, where, and who, and what one needs to be done, but also developing these research questions directly with uh, with the community uh, affected, <coughs> and then on the systemic change which is needed. Again, uh, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, studies and and, and the research that needs to be done there into the. How do we improve the governance of the institutional systems to make sure that uh, the climate security nexus is accounted for? So thank you. Karina. Uh, thank you for your question um, from the colleague from Sudan. I think those that are here, we need to ensure delegations are diverse and reflecting of community voices. And so the Federation, the International Federation of Red Cross, Red Crescent Societies, for example, takes this very seriously. And at COP last year, we had uh, 25 national societies on our delegation. We had 15 on their own government delegations. 60% of the delegation was women. Close to 10% of the delegation is youth. And again, national societies represent those that are most remote, most vulnerable, most insecure. And we bring those stories, those voices, those experiences to the COP. And so I would encourage anybody here on a delegation that you also really stand up for diverse delegations that represent the people that we're talking about here. Global action needs to be, global ambition needs to be met by local action. Thank Thanks, you. Karina. Dane, last word from you. So, uh, on WPS, gender and uh, voices of people from affected communities are way of managing that is is really a quota system for travel support and speaking roles um, and then but requiring it to be a part of the content and, and all of our thematic days as a cross-cutting element and on data to Coco's point I think it's understanding or it's better analysis of what what kind of returns you see from food water and resilience investments in, in settings like this thank you Thank you, Dane. And thank you all very, very much for being here with us today. Huge thanks to our speakers, both here in the room and online. I wish you a good rest of conference. <laughs>